In 2016, Maverick Applied Science developed the Plant Engineers FRP Forum to create a platform where plant engineers could come together for in-depth discussions and exchange ideas on matters related to FRP equipment and piping reliability. After the success of the forum in 2016, we presented the second annual Plant Engineers FRP Forum on May 10th and 11th, 2017. The 2017 forum included 20 presentations and discussions on FRP and dual laminate equipment with attendees from all over the country. Discussions range from FRP scrubber designs, the merits of the RTP1 standard, shop inspection expectations, acoustic emission testing, and fluoropolymers. The depth of the content was truly impressive. Since everyone was not able to attend, we would like to share some of these presentations by webcast to the general industrial community. Um, I'm going to talk this morning about why thermoplastics fail in, in chemical applications. And this is, this is actually a topic that I could talk on for half a day easily. Um, there's obviously a whole lot of thermoplastics out there and a whole lot of reasons that they can fail. So this, this could go on forever, but they put me right before lunch, which is probably a good thing. So I've tried to pare it down as much as possible to uh, just a, a few of the more common thermoplastics and, and some of the more common reasons that they fail. And, and some things we'll touch on just really very quickly and other things we'll go into in more detail. So before we talk about why things fail, we have to talk about why they hold together in the first place. Um, and there are three different broad categories of thermoplastics that are held together in different ways. Uh, the first is called amorphous polymers, um, and PVC and CPVC fall into this category. And polymers like this, polymers as you know are long chain molecules, long chain organic molecules. Um, amorphous polymers are held together only by entanglements of those molecules. They're just big long chains like spaghetti tangled up together. Then there is another class of polymers known as semi, whoops, sorry, wrong one, semi-crystalline polymers. Um, and polymers like this tend to pack together in crystal, crystalline ordered structures. Um, and those are very strongly held together and in between the crystalline structures, the crystalline structures are kind of these, these parallel lines here. In between, there's a lot of amorphous material where there's just entanglements. Um, and, and the crystalline structures are, are very tough, but in between, it's very flexible. Um, and so crystalline polymers have a melting point, TM melting point where those crystal structures will melt. And when you melt the crystal structures, a semi-crystalline polymer flows like a melted candle. It flows like candle wax very easily. Um, amorphous polymers don't have a melting point um, because there's no crystal structure to melt. But what both polymers have is what's called a glass transition temperature. A glass transition temperature is where these molecules kind of freeze and stop moving. So crystal, semi-crystalline polymers are used above their glass transition temperature. So in between the crystal structures, all this amorphous phase is very flexible. It's very mobile. All those polymers are very easily able to move around among each other. That, that does a lot of things. It makes the polymer more flexible. So if you've used polypropylene or polyethylene, you'll notice they're a lot more flexible than PVC or CPVC. That's because amorphous polymers are used below their glass transition temperature. They're in a glassy state. Their molecules are pretty well frozen in place and they don't move very easily uh, without heat or solvent. On the other hand, semi-crystalline polymers are used above their glass transition temperature. So in between the crystals, everything's pretty flexible and mobile. Um, that means that they're more permeable to chemicals, for one thing, because those molecules can get out of the way and allow chemicals to penetrate in. It means they're more flexible, like I said. Um, the, the other difference is amorphous polymers can be cemented with solvents. You can use solvent cement on PVC or CPVC because the solvent 
is able to mobilize those, those frozen molecules and get them moving. Solvents are not able to melt those crystals though. And so you cannot solvent cement polypropylene or polyethylene because the solvents don't dissolve the crystals. You have to actually melt those crystals with heat. So semi-crystalline polymers can only be heat fused and not cemented. Um, amorphous polymers can be either heat fused or cemented. You can get those molecules moving either with heat or with solvents. Um, to, to make a good weld with polypropylene or any of these, these uh, semi-crystalline polymers though, once you melt them and push them together, you have to get crystals to form across the interface. With amorphous polymers, you, you use solvents or you use heat, you push them together, you, you have to get tangles to form across the interface. Um, and then there's thermoset polymers, which I'm not going to talk about much today, but that's what everybody else has been talking about today is FRP, which is a thermoset polymer. Um, and thermoset polymers um, are actually, the molecules are actually tied together by a chemical reaction. And so when, when you talk about things curing, what you're actually doing is causing chemical reactions to tie those molecules together. And once you've tied them together, they are set. You cannot move them too easily with heat or too easily with solvents. Um, and so you have to actually make another chemical reaction and tie onto them again, basically. You can't, you can't just make the molecules move and then come together. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about thermoset polymers today because my topic is thermoplastic. So we're going to talk about things like PVC, CPVC, polyethylene, polypropylene, PVDF, things that might be used as liners for um, FRP or things that might be used as standalone um, for piping or, or vessels as well. So let's take a look at what these molecules actually look like um, on the, on the, uh, at the molecular level. Now I couldn't get everything in the same color. I got some of these pictures offline. Some of them are my own. Um, but they are all the, whoop, I keep doing that. Okay, sorry, apologize. Um, the gray molecules, the black molecules, and the green molecules here are all carbon. Polymers are all, at their heart, mostly a carbon chain. The, here, the little blue molecules, the white molecules here, and the white molecules, atoms down here, I'm sorry, are hydrogen. And for CPVC and PVC, these huge red, I don't know why we made them red, it should have been green. These huge red molecules are chlorine. Uh, the pink atoms here are uh, fluorine, and there is no fluorine or chlorine. This is just carbon and hydrogen on uh, polyethylene and polypropylene. Now, what do you learn by looking at these molecular structures? This is a pretty simple chain here. And it, like I said, it's like candle wax. If you want to break this chain, there's a, not a lot protecting it. The little, the little hydrogen atoms stuck on the outside don't do much to protect it. Um, and so things like polyethylene and polypropylene are fairly sensitive to oxidizing type chemicals. And I, I think uh, it might have been you that said this morning, 20 parts per million of, of hypochlorite in a caustic stream just totally killed the poly, polypropylene. Uh, yes, that will happen because sodium hypochlorite is a strong oxidizer and these types of, um, these types of polymers require the presence of an antioxidant in them to protect them from oxidizers like bleach or, or sulfuric acid. And the, the antioxidant is sacrificial, so it does go away over time. There will be a limited amount of time that you have antioxidant working for you, and eventually it will go away and the, the oxidizer will destroy the HDPE or the poly, polypropylene. Now, because these are fairly flexible molecules, though, they don't require much other than uh, antioxidants to keep them going. Um, things like PVC and CPVC, amorphous polymers, because they're used in their glassy state, they are like glass, pretty brittle. 
And so typically PVC and CPVC have um, other polymers blended into them to give them more impact strength, maybe a little more flexibility or, or toughness uh, to resist impacts and things like that. But on the other hand, they've got these huge chlorine molecules stuck to the outside of them. These are like armor for that polymer chain on the inside. The PVC and CPVC are kind of like the armadillos of, of, <laughs> of plastics. These, these chlorine molecules protect that backbone very highly. It's, it's hard for oxidizers to even approach the carbon chain to break it. It's, it's like, like armor on the, the carbon chain. So they don't require any antioxidants for um, oxidation resistance. They are just inherently oxidation resistant because they're wearing armor. PVDF is, is similar. It's got these big fluorine molecules stuck on it, and those act like um, those act like uh, armor as well for the PD, PVDF. But the other thing that they do, fluorine molecules are so greedy for electrons that they suck some of the electron charge off of the neighboring hydrogens. Um, and so those hydrogens are sort of extra positive. And so when you have chemicals that are looking for protons, and that, that's strong basis basically, everybody knows PVDF's weakness is strong basis. When you have a strong base that's looking for a proton, and these are, these are not happy because the fluorines are sucking some of their electron charge away. Those are really labile protons. They're very easy for the caustic to come in and suck one of those protons off and start to degrade that chain. Okay, so that's a lot of talking on the first two slides. But the, ne the next is um, the next things are going to be sort sort of examples of things that can go wrong with various different types of polymers. So what pulls these polymer chains apart? Well, you can have fairly simple things like mechanical forces. Fast, uh, fast acting mechanical forces like impact or burst, you're all engineers, you're pretty familiar with mechanical forces. Slow acting mechanical forces like creep. Polymers um, tend to creep, which means if you put a, put a force, uh, apply a force to them, like if I had to hold this, out here for a minute. I could do that very easily. If I had to hold it out to the end of the day, my arm would start to creep <laughs> and it would start to go down. Similarly with um, polymers, you can apply a very large pressure to them for a minute or two, but if you want it to hold that same pressure for 50 years, you have to back it off and, and use a lower pressure because it is going to creep over time. Then there can be um, chemical factors, degradation or solvation and plasticization, and you can all probably picture in your head what these things mean. The, the, the areas where people tend to get um, confused as to what's happening to the polymer is where you have both of them acting at the same time. And you can have, if you have slow acting forces combined with degradation from chemicals, we call that stress corrosion cracking. Um, and if you have slow acting forces combined with solvation or plasticization type chemicals, we call that environmental stress cracking. And we're going to go over some examples of all these different types of failure um, coming up. So what else affects these, these um, processes? Temperature, pressure, concentration, obviously. Um, and strain, impingements the way the fabrication is done, the quality of the fabrication as well. Do you get, do you actually get crystallization across the weld surface if you're welding polypropylene? Do you actually get good molecular entanglement across the weld surface if you're welding CPVC or PVC? Um, manufacturing quality of the material that you're talking about too. Um, those molecules have to come out of the, the manufacturing process if you're talking about a manufactured pipe or a manufactured sheet. They have to come out well entangled or well crystallized and if they're not as well entangled or crystallized as they need to be, they will tend to fall apart in chemical um, environments or in mechanical uh, stresses faster than they would if they were well fit together. Um, 
and also extraneous chemicals, like Jeff said this morning, that, that 20 parts per million of, of hypochlorite really completely ruined the polypropylene. Similarly, low levels of solvents can ruin PVC or CPVC uh, plastics as well. Um, and we'll see some examples of that too. So uh, we'll start with purely mechanical effects and then we'll go to purely chemical effects and then I'll get to some of those combinations of mechanical and chemical effects. And we won't spend a lot of time on mechanical effects because I assume most of you are mechanical type of people and so you really understand these things. But one thing I wanted to, to point out was that plastic, plastic pipe or plastic sheet are typically almost tempered like glass. So because they extrude the pipe it comes out hot and they have to cool it immediately. That's the same process that you use to temper glass, right? You cool the outside surface really quick. Um, and so when, uh, when they do that, that creates a, a stress profile on the, uh, it through the wall thickness of the pipe. So this is the outside surface of a pipe, the inside surface of a pipe. Most of it's under tensile stress, but the outside surface is under compressive stress. And so when you have an impact damage to a piece of pipe, it tends to form a ligature at the outside surface. Um, the crack very seldom goes all the way through the pipe. It goes most of the way through and stops. And so it's, it's kind of fortuitous that I'm following the, 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 the presentation on inspection. When you're inspecting a piece of plastic pipe for damage, you need to look at the inside surface, not the outside surface. Um, Next, purely mechanical effects, fatigue damage. Again, I, I assume most of your mechanical engineers, you're probably familiar with fatigue. So I just wanted to show you an example of what a fatigued fracture surface looks like. It looks almost like you would actually expect a fatigued surface to look like. You can see the, the buildup of damage over time, like the rings in a tree. Um, and those are just propagation fronts. It's not necessarily one front for every um, mechanical cycle. It's, it's a cumulative damage effect. So it might be 10 cycles, 20 cycles, 100 cycles per ring. Uh, but eventually it, you've damaged it enough to where it cracks a little more and then you keep with your fatiguing type of stress and, and you get that. And again, that, these usually start at a notch area. Uh, people have talked a lot about designs and stresses in designs. It's the same with thermoplastics. If you have sharp notches in the design of a part or in the design of a welded area, um, that's a place where fatigue can tend to start. So moving on to purely chemical effects. Um, this is some CPVC that was in, um, again, we're talking about parts per million here of toluene in, a, in an acid solution. It was mostly hydrochloric acids, should have been a good application for CPVC, but there were parts per million of toluene in it. Water insoluble chemicals are not in there in parts per million. It might be, you know, 99.9% .9 hydrochloric acid and 0.1% toluene. That 0.1% is bubbles of pure toluene floating along. And so in that bubble of pure toluene, bounces off the wall of the polymer, it's easily absorbed uh, by the CPVC, and that's exactly what happened. And it, um, it caused swelling and solvation, and eventually the pipe burst. Um, now, water-soluble chemicals are different. If this had been something like methanol, which is perfectly water-soluble, those are individual methanol molecules floating along in the water. And so even if they bounce off the wall, you get much fewer of them, much less of them um, bouncing against the wall. And, and then they're also floating on top because they're water soluble. Um, so whereas you can to tolerate things like methanol easily up to 10%, say, for PVC or CPVC, things like toluene, even a few parts per million can be very detrimental. in that one. Okay, so purely chemical effects. Now we'll talk about oxidation and degradation. Uh, sulfuric acid is a very strong oxidizing chemical and it tends to degrade by, by what's 
commonly called treeing. If you look at these, I should have put them in in the other direction. Uh, but, but people who do failure analysis will call this kind of a structure a tree. Um, and, and basically what happens is the, the sulfuric acid starts degradation and it's easier to degrade where it's already degrading. So it penetrates in, worms its way into the, the polymer somewhat. Um, CPBC holds, holds up very well to um, oxidizers like this. This was 10 years in service and there's only um, a maximum of about a millimeter of, of penetration of the 98% sulfuric acid. Um, this, is, um, this is polypropylene um, that was in 98% sulfuric acid. The temperature was a lot higher. It was 70 degrees C. Uh, but it was only eight weeks, eight weeks in, in, this was actually a test sample, not in service. Um, but you can see the, the degradation moving into the polypropylene and the loss of antioxidant uh, on the surface. And this is uh, PVDF that was in uh, three different kinds of acid. PVDF is really, really um, resistant to uh, acids and strong oxidizing chemicals. Oh, did it again. <laughs> it's really resistant to acids and strong oxidizing chemicals. This was nitric acid. These are all 30 years in service. Um, sulfuric acid, hydrofluoric acid. You'll notice the hydrofluoric acid uh, appears quite a lot worse. Hydrofluoric acid is a very tiny little molecule, so it's very easy to penetrate into all kinds of plastics. CPVC and PVC, even though they're typically impermeable to most types of chemicals, um, will absorb a fair amount of hydrofluoric acid and, and certainly semi-crystalline polymers like um, PVDF or polypropylene, polyethylene tend to absorb even more um, hydrofluoric acid. Um, and this is, um, again, oxidation in chlorinated water. Um, Typically, the water that you drink is only about three to five parts per million chlorine. Um, but that, that three to five parts per million can be very aggressive to, to chemicals that don't have good oxidation resistance. So if you talk about going up to 20 parts per million, um, that's <coughs> quite a lot compared to uh, drinking water. And um, so what happens here is it, it tends to break the polymer chains, it's very easy to break the polymer chains. It, it goes into those in between the carbon molecules, on atoms on the, the HDPE um, molecule and just breaks the hydrogen off, breaks the, the uh, carbons apart and the molecules just tend to break down into shorter and shorter pieces. Um, and the other thing you'll notice is the kind of mud cracking. This, this is the wall thickness and then this is this kind of out of focus area up here is the inside diameter. You see this kind of cross hatching effect up here um, that's sometimes called mud cracking. Um, and what's happening there is as the molecules get shorter and shorter, they're even easier to crystallize so they kind of collapse in on themselves and pull away from each other um, and you get this mud cracking effect. And then um, CPVC, this is dehydrochlorination of CPVC and ammonium hydroxide. Generally, PVC and CPVC have really good resistance to both acids and caustics um, because the, the chlorine um, isn't strong enough. It, it also um, sucks some of the uh, electrons off of the neighboring hydrogens, but it doesn't do it as much as the fluorine does. So CPVC and PVC typically aren't um, as sensitive to caustics as PVEF is. But CPVC is very, very sensitive to ammonium hydroxide because um, those chlorines are very reactive. Chlorine and ammonia love to react with each other. That's why they tell you don't mix bleach and ammonia when you're cleaning in your house um, because they love to react with each other and it'll react with the chlorine on the CPVC. Those, if you remember back to the the picture of the molecule that I showed you, the, that armor is crowded on there. All those big red atoms are crowded on there. And because they're crowded on there, they, they can't be stuck on as tight. And it, 
they're just PVC won't do this, but CV, CPVC will because the chlorines are just slightly less tightly stuck onto the, the backbone of the molecule and the ammonia can rip them right, right off. So now we're going to talk about combined chemical and mechanical effects. What's going on there? So, um, check my time. So with um, stress corrosion cracking, in both cases, the, the first sentence here is the same. With stress corrosion cracking, you have strain on the polymer network expanding the free volume between the molecules and allowing more penetration of the chemicals. So it, whether you have entanglements or whether you have crystallizations, when you have strain, when you have something pulling on that plastic molecule, um, that makes more space in between the molecules and it allows the chemicals to penetrate into the plastic a little bit easier. Um, now in the case of stress corrosion cracking, we're talking about corrosive chemicals penetrating in and the corrosive chemicals are then able to break the chains. So even if you think about cutting a piece of string or a rope, it's a lot easier to cut the rope if you stretch it first, right? If you take your scissors and try to cut a, a floppy string, it doesn't work very well or a knife. But if you stretch it, it's easier to cut. The same with molecules. You stretch those molecules, it's easier to break them. Um, now with environmental stress cracking, we're talking about absorbing chemicals that are solvents or plasticizers. And the chemicals, rather than breaking the chains, there's no degradation of the polymer going on here. What's happening is um, environmental stress cracking means those amorphous areas, we're, we're undoing those entanglements. It's almost like putting olive oil on spaghetti. You know, if you, if you have spaghetti with no olive oil on it, it kind of sticks together pretty easily and you have a hard time serving it out of the dish. You put a little olive oil on it, it's easier to slide those chains apart from each other. Um, and the same thing is going on with environmental stress cracking in plastics. Um, when the, when it, the plastic absorbs something like an oil, a surfactant, a, a solvent, um, then they're easier to disentangle when the, uh, the strain is pulling on them. So this is, this is just an example of stress corrosion cracking of PVDF in a caustic environment. Um, so there, there was an impingement on this uh, PVDF, something <coughs> causing just a little bit of strain on the inside surface of the, the pipe. This was a small uh, PVDF pipe that failed. Um, and when that happens, you've got that strain, PVDF is already um, somewhat sensitive to caustic, to, to degradation by caustic because those hydrogen atoms are so easy to abstract um, and it, it just breaks down the polymer chains and eventually a crack begins to form. Uh, similarly with, with CPVC, this, is a, this was a wet chlorine gas header and they fabricated a flanged end. This was a, actually a a dual laminate piece and to, to make the end they took a piece of the pipe and they just flared it out and, and made a flange end that way. Well when you do that you put an awful lot of strain on that outside bend there and when you look at it under a microscope this was, was six months in use in a, in a wet gas header. Um, in the straight pipe you get a little bit of corrosion but it doesn't look too bad. Uh, as you start to go into the transition area, the, the corrosion starts to look a little bit worse. And then right there where the, the flange bends over, um, you get quite a lot of corrosion and cracking in both directions um, because of the, the strain on the polymer combined with the, um, you know, the corrosion of the chlorine. Now, environmental stress cracking, like I said, is, is where solvents or oils tend to allow the molecules to, to disentangle and ease themselves apart. And so when that happens, the fracture surface tends to be very glassy um, because um, you're, you're pulling the molecules apart and lubricate, they're lubricated as they come apart by the, the chemical agent. 
And so um, with a mechanical fracture, the fracture surfaces tend to be dull and smooth or dull and rough if it's growing slowly, dull and smooth if it's growing quickly. But when you see a, a glassy fracture surface in an amorphous polymer like this, that indicates that, that a chemical was involved in easing those um, uh, polymer molecules apart. And again, this, this goes back to the, the idea of you have to know even down to the, the small levels, what, it, what kinds of things are in the, the water or the, the fluid that's flowing through the pipe. Um, this was wastewater, typical industrial wastewater, but it had some insoluble oils floating along in it. And so along the top of the pipe, these little stress cracks uh, tended to form until they got through most of the wall thickness and then they got to the point where the, the pipe wall is not thick enough to, to hold the pressure that it's supposed to bear and the whole pipe burst eventually. So quality makes a difference. Um, now we're gonna talk a, a few things about how quality can affect the performance that you're expecting. So this is uh, CPVC, and in all cases, these were different pipes that were in 98% sulfuric acid surface. Um, and going back to the, the picture we saw earlier, well-made CPVC pipe is good at oxidation resistance. After 10 years, you've only got a millimeter of penetration. This pipe did not fail or anything. They just took it out to see how it was doing, and, and we thought, well, you know, a millimeter over 10 years, you've got got probably another 20, 30 years left to go before this pipe is going to fail. But this pipe, on the other hand, was only in service three years. Most of the way around, it's got fairly little penetration, but very regularly spaced, it goes all the way through. Why is this? Well, if you've ever seen plastic pipe manufactured, it has to, it has to go over a mandrel to put the hole in the middle of the pipe. And the mandrel is held in place by legs, evenly spaced legs. <laughs> and so as the melt is, is flowing off the end of the extruder screws, it flows around these legs and it has to come back together. And it has to entangle once it gets to the other side. If it doesn't entangle very well when it gets to the other side, it's not going to have the same chemical resistance as the rest of the melt. Um, it, there's going to be more free volume between those molecular chains, um, more space for chemicals to get in um, and wreak havoc, basically. Um, and so in this case, it failed on every single spider line after only about three years, um, even though the bulk of the polymer was holding up pretty well like we would have expected the whole thing did over here. This, on the other hand, was very, very poorly processed uh, CPVC pipe. Um, it was in similar application, 97% sulfuric acid at room temperature. It lasted only three months. It absorbed a whole lot of acid. It penetrated all the way through to the outside. Um, but this pipe was, was so poorly made, usually, you know, you can slice off a piece and it looks like monolithic. <laughs> you know, a monolithic piece of plastic. In this case, if you tried to whittle it, it was almost like whittling string cheese. <laughs> the pipe would come apart in layers. It was, it was so badly made. So it's very important um, to get, you know, not only to specify the material that you want, but to know that you're getting it from a good quality source. Um, and similarly with caustics, um, and again, because I work in CPVC, a lot of my a lot of my uh, examples here are CPVC, uh, but CPVC generally has very, very good resistance to caustic. This was, um, keep doing that, 50% uh, sodium hydroxide, 80 degrees C for a year and a half, well processed pipe, 30 microns of corrosion, almost nothing, very minimal, should last a good long time. Um, on the other hand, this was marginally processed uh, material. The concentration is much less. Uh, the temperatures eat a little bit less, times a little bit more. But this is uh, one of those spider lines I talked about. This is a larger diameter pipe, so I couldn't get a picture of the, the, the end of the pipe uh, like I did in the previous slide. 
but it split on the spider lines because they weren't as well held together. And then again, this was very, very poorly processed material and, and it's not well held together at all. And after, um, again, a moderate concentration, fairly high temperature, but two years, it's, it's completely falling apart because it's poorly processed material. Um, and just one more slide on how quality makes a difference. This was a uh, chlorate process in the chloralkali industry. That's a very odd looking um, piece here. It almost looks like wood grain, right? This, this is actually the melt. <coughs> this is as the, the CPVC melt is flowing off the screws. It's, it's not one homogeneous thing. It's flowing in waves. And after, um, I don't remember how long this had been. It, it, it was several years in service, but not as many as they, they would have liked or as they were used to in this particular plant. Um, and and the, the melt flow patterns in the pipe are actually exposed. And again, these are the spider lines in between the, uh, the <coughs> legs that hold the mandrel in place in the extruder. So, and then um, going back to uh, those, those few parts per million of, of who knows what in your process, uh, and a lot of people have touched on it in the different presentations I've listened to this morning. You know, it's not important enough to say, well, we're, it's not well enough to say what 99% of your process is. That last 1% can, can really be the kicker that can make a difference between whether what you specify is going to work or not. Um, so in this case, they, they specified CPVC for what they said was a water treatment flocculant at 105 degrees Fahrenheit. This should work for decades with CPVC. Didn't last very long at all because it absorbed butyl acetophenone out of the water treatment flocculant. I don't know what particular their process was, but that was something important that they should have known and specified before choosing their material. Um, and then this, this as well, this was a CPVC pipe. They said it was 20 to 30 percent aluminum chloride in water at 105 degrees Fahrenheit. CPVC should work all day long for decades in that type of an application. When we analyzed the pipe, <laughs> we found a whole lot of stuff in there. This was actually a ibuprofen manufacturing. This was waste water from ibuprofen manufacturing. And we had all sorts of solvents and chemicals in there. And then they were present probably at very low levels in that waste water. But those parts per million ended up being very, very important. So my last slide. Failure is success if we learn from it. Everybody, when they have a failure, tends to say, well, we're not going to do that again. But it's very important to know what you're not going to do again. Did you completely choose the wrong material? Did you have the right material, but did you have poor quality? Did you have the right material and the right quality, but a poor design? Um, or did you have the right material, the right quality, a good design, but it was badly executed by the fabricator? Uh, so it, it's, you know, it's very easy when you're having a problem, you know, we've, we've got to get it fixed, we've got to get this broken part out, we've got to get a new part in, and we've got to get going. But after the fact, when you have a little time, it's very important to go back and look at what went wrong um, so that you know what not to do next time. So with that, I will take questions if anybody has any. Michelle, I yes. have a is, is there a, as, as we'll say a plant owner or an engineer, is there a way to qualify these molders? I mean, obviously, the result is a provider of all CPC or other plastic providers as well. Uh, but then it's going to be made in the sheets and pipes too and so on. Is there a, like you showed with the spider issues and other is, is there something we can check to, to know that we're getting a good molder, that it's coming from a good source? Is there a means to do that? Um, 
there there are tests that can that, that can be run um, and certainly you can always ask for the manufacturer's quality control records um, on the, the lots of pipe or fittings that you're buying they they you're buying a pipe or fittings they're required to do burst testing and, and impact testing on pipe and those sorts of things and you can ask for those um, with things like PVC and CPVC, you can you can look at things like solvent immersion testing, acid dump <coughs> testing for PVC or uh, MIBK testing for, for CPVC that will give you some idea of the molecular entanglement and fusion level um, in those types of polymers. Um, Cross-link density in, in cross-link polymers can be measured um, as well. And, and Crystallinity can also be measured in polypropylene. Some of these are analytical tests um, that you might have to contract out. Um, but, but yeah, you might want to look at getting an outside lab to, to measure crystallinity <coughs> or, or um, cross-link density so or those sorts of things. samples and send them to the lab. Yeah. I gotta say something to that. Just, uh, that's, that's the R&D side of it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we like to call it the, uh, the the good specification. I know we'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow in, in, in a discussion that we'll have in my talk, but that's kind of our whole philosophy around the, the Corzan technology. You know, we, I say it a lot about Corzan. Corzan is CPVC. CPVC is not Corzan. And, and the reason being is it's, it's our whole system of, of how we go to market. We're, we're behind the scenes, we're suppliers, and basically Corzan becomes a quality specification. That's why there's a lot of municipalities, there's end users, there's, there's a lot of people that says, look, I just want Corzan material. And what that means is it's the, it's the combination of having a network of manufacturers, where it's multiple manufacturers for competitiveness. Um, but we have a group, Michelle does our chemical resistance testing and a lot of our ASTMs, analyticals and things like that, but we have a whole other group that does extrusion design. So they help our, our customers out with their extrusion injection molding equipment. There's, a, uh, there's additional testing and things that's contractually between us and our customers that we work with that they have to test for good, good quality extrusion and things. So there's a lot more to the equation than just a, uh, a piece of pipe. Because the reality is that most of these facilities, when they start to use it, you know, they, you, you can take a piece of pipe and you can send it in, but how do you qualify every lot that comes in? Is it, you know what I mean, there's a different lots coming off and you get it from distributors and things like that. And so if you, if you start saying, I just want a certain lot of material, there's a, uh, man, it's, it's hard to control. It's hard to, to get that. So for us, consistency is huge. And that's what we try to bring to the table with the technology is that there's multiple manufacturers, consistent performance. And like what Michelle was talking about at the end there is that we like to do that through the whole process. If there's ever an issue, you know, we're able to figure out why. To help most instances tell you why we had an issue and how we can prevent ourselves from having another issue. And that's, that's, that's one of the instances that we try to bring to the table. So what she didn't say in a lot of those analytical pictures was that she didn't identify which ones were towards and which ones weren't. I know which ones were. <laughs> <laughs> so that pharmaceutical plant best off to all that different chemistry down in their drains? Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, they, they wanted to know why the pipe failed. You know, they were trying to blame the manufacturing quality or whatever. Um, That's hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> Usually and they don't want to talk about that. Yeah. So it goes out another head. Thank you very much. And I can talk about you know all streams and my products. Well, and and I don't I don't know where that pipe was used. It could have been going to their water treatment plant, and uh, hopefully it wasn't going to the sewer. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Um,